Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Detention. We are super excited to be joined tonight by Justin Dare. Justin was born and raised in Houston, Texas. He began participating in triathlon while in college at Texas A&M, where he helped found the triathlon team. Following college, he began coaching and worked at the Endurance Corner as a coach and events director, or events director eventually becoming its owner and manager. Uh, although racing professionally wasn't in Justin's sights when he started the sport, he went from Ironman finisher in 2001 to Ironman champion, winning Ironman Boulder in 2014. He has completed over 40 Ironman races in his career, including 10 top three finishes, 18 top five finishes, 29 top tens. His Ironman PR is a very quick 8.13.35, and he retired at the end of 2020 after a 14-year professional career. Justin Dare, welcome to detention. No place I'd rather be. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Spoken like somebody who has been in detention attention before. Um, that's our first question uh, for everybody when they get on here. Uh, is this your first time in detention? Um, like not in school? Uh, so I got, uh, I didn't get in trouble very much in school. Um, not that I didn't really act up, but I think like I always pulled back before I would get caught doing something. So I got detention maybe uh, once. I, I did get in trouble and had in school suspension one time. Ooh. Uh, for uh, for being involved in alcohol on a school uh, camping trip, um, I was I was uh, I was ratted out. So, oh. um, so I took my punishment, did my time, and went back went back in. So. I like I like how you, yeah being involved with alcohol is a good good deployment of the passive voice there. Yeah. That's good. So we've been doing this for about a year now, which seems almost impossible, but it's real nonetheless. Um, what has the last year made room for you in, uh, whether it's training, racing, uh, or whatever, what is this allowed time for that you wouldn't have had time for otherwise? Uh, well, like 2020 was sort of a mess in the sense that I had already planned on basically stopping racing at the end of the year. Um, and then I was like, well, is, are there races? Are there not races? Like it, it, when March came around, I was like, oh, am I retired um, now or am I retired later? And so it's kind of wishy-washy in that way. So once uh, I was actually able to call it good at the beginning of January, I went on a two month living in a van trip, snowboarding uh, all over the West. So me and a buddy created a COVID bubble and or whatever quarantine bubble and went around and so i skied well skied snowboarded over 50 days um through that time period and that's something i haven't done since i you know i was in a teenager so um so i could never do that when i was racing and that was that was something that i had wanted to do as soon as i was done racing was i was like i need i need two or three years with massive days on mountains to offset all the time i missed uh, when I had to exercise a lot. So I was able to do that, which I greatly appreciated, even though it was like with COVID and everything, it wasn't really, you know, we were, it wasn't quite the same, you know, you can't like, you don't interact with many people or, um, you know, you're kind of like not hanging out at bars afterwards, <laughs> you're going back to a van. So, um, so there's elements of it that didn't, that didn't get to happen, but uh, it was kind of like a pretty, nice opportunity that I was able to capitalize on. Um, did that trip kind of give you like some perspective on your career? Like, did anything kind of occur to you? Were you able to kind of look back on your career as an athlete differently than if you hadn't had the chance to take that trip? Uh, I think more of like the entirety of 2020, because it was like, instead of instead of having this abrupt finish, like, oh, I did all these races and then, you know, I raced yesterday and today I'm done. It was like in hindsight, I was actually done more or less like at the end of 2019. And uh, it, it um, was kind of just sort of forced upon me as opposed to being like this hard decision to make, like, oh, I'm doing this under under perfect circumstances. And so, I think I had been reflecting for actually like a year and having to come to grips with um, 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, there might be athletes out there that feel like completely content at the end of their career. Um, I was not one of them, but I also came to the realization that there probably was nothing that was ever going to make me feel a hundred percent content. It's just kind of like, they just end and then you reflect. And, and what I kind of reflected on was the middle, like when you're in the middle of something, that's when it's the best. Like the starting being a professional wasn't that great and the end wasn't that great, but the middle was super great. And I think with most things, if you really reflect on what it is, like your time in college, if, if you enjoyed that time, it probably wasn't like your freshman orientation and it may not have been your graduation. It's like all that stuff in between when you were far enough in and also far enough away from the finish that you're just kind of in the moment and enjoying things. And that was kind of what I walked away being grateful for was just kind of that, what, that period of time where I just, all I really cared about was, you know, racing and training well, and I was all in and I was fully consumed by it in a, in a way that made me happy. <clears throat> So why snowboarding for the van life adventure? What role has that played in your life? Well, I have this like one anomaly year where uh, in high school, I went to this winter sports academy in Crested Butte. So I, that year I snowboarded a hundred days, let's say. And then my parents ended up moving to Crested Butte later. So I used to go back and, and get in. Even in high school, I probably still got, um, maybe 20 days a year. But ever since then, I hardly get any. And like, especially when I was racing, um, you know, some years it was zero and some years it maybe it was two or three days. Um, and when I, when I was in college, like prior to triathlon, I thought that I was going to go be a ski bomb as soon as I was done. Uh, so I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to bust through this college thing. And then I'm going to go um, live in a few different ski towns and ski and um so like triathlon ended up being something i was super driven about but that's not like i wasn't actually driven to do anything else um <laughs> like like i don't i don't know where i would have ended up but i was not interested in um you know going straight into the workforce or something like that i was more interested in kind of moving and bumming around a bit so this is kind of me doing that like living vicariously 20 years later or something like that. I've been in the same boat, so well done. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you, you formally retire at the end of 2020. Um, what, what have you been now doing with yourself for the first four months of 2021? What has retiring made room for that maybe you did not expect? Well, I kind of looked into going back to school for a few different things, but I kind of ended up putting that on pause. And um, so I've continued coaching. Um, I, I always coached throughout my career, but I'm not coaching more per se right now. Um, I may, I, I'm not really sure. Um, but I've kind of just uh, allowed myself a little bit of time to not actually have to do a whole bunch of things every single day. Um, and so, you know, I'm able to, to read more and do other things that I enjoy a little bit more um, with my time. And I kind of talked to, I actually talked to um, a few other people about kind of the transition out of that world. And um, I actually talked to someone who had been a big ski racer and, and now is a, sports agent but he was like i needed a year he's like for a year i really didn't like take on a big project just yet so i kind of feel as though i'm sort of in that space of i definitely know that something is going to come up that i'm going to want to go into but i haven't really been super inspired to try to fill that time i'm not like one of those people that wants like a big to-do list like i actually want like very few things to do, but, but eventually like something I get super excited about, I end up putting a lot of time into. And I think not spreading myself out into a bunch of things prior to that kind of allows those moments to happen. And for a long time, that was, you know, getting ready for races. And doing it. 
So having asked for some advice yourself in that position, um, what advice would you give to an athlete at the end of their career now? So the main thing, one thing I said is uh, don't plan for it, just do it. So, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you know, I don't know what, what that would be, you know, maybe if you're above 35 or something and you're still racing, I'd be like, just do it one year at a time. Just keep, just keep, like every year, basically re-sign yourself. <laughs> um, you know, I'd be like, and I know, I think, I think it's probably tempting to maybe sign like long-term sponsorship deals, but I would in those positions, cause you're like, I want some security or something, but I might, I might actually suggest I'd be like, just sign one year deals because you're, you're really just constantly asking yourself, like, is this something that I want to keep doing? Is this something that I'm excited about instead of, cause I kind of felt like I was a little bit sort of in this position, like three years out of finishing, I decided that I was going to give it three more years. And I think that was a mistake. Like, I think I could have ended up doing three more years, but I would have preferred to just make that call every December or whatever, um, which I know. So yeah, so actually like being a little more in the moment and a little more spontaneous with your decisions later, which maybe seems counterintuitive. Um, but I think like you need that hunger and fight and it, you can get complacent in the end. And that's something I think you really want to avoid because all the people coming up are hungry. So <laughs> they'll be um, per they'll be perfectly happy to walk all over you complacent. <laughs> they love a complacent person. They eat complacent people for breakfast. Yeah. 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 Uh, what are you reading? You said you're uh, reading some books and things like that. What is uh, what's on your bookshelf at the moment? Uh, well, I've been reading this year I've been reading a little more fiction. So I was reading Ken Follett's like Century Trilogy. They follow, follows whatever, five families across um, kind of Downton Abbey time period is where it starts. It starts in like 1912 or 10 or somewhere in there. And uh, I think it, I don't know where it actually finishes up. Like the second book starts um, in the early 1930s and goes through World War II. So I think the last book covers um, Cold War era, but I don't know where it concludes. So, um, how many, yeah, it's how like many... historical fiction. So, mm -hmm. um, like the last couple of years, um, I did read fiction, but it was a little more tilted towards nonfiction, mostly biographies and stuff. Uh, and I was trying to get a little bit away from that because I think it's important to read more fiction too. So. Tell us about Downton Abbey. Are you a Downton Abbey fan? <laughs> well, I think we were talking earlier and trying to distinguish. For some reason, I've, I've, the Chris Bag and Amy, they think I'm a Downton Abbey zealot because I gave an impassioned speech about it. Where was it? At that Wildflower? I think it was at Wildflower. Um, um, so we're in the, we're in the camper and I'm just going off about Earl Grantham and just, <laughs> super excited no i did i did like the show um or do like the show um um you know i got my wife to watch it i was like we should definitely watch this show this like early 20th century time piece of english aristocracy and like basically like a, a hundred year old soap opera more or less um but yeah i like i liked it as a time piece it's, i you know like peaky blinders is kind of similar in the sort of a timepiece of that kind of post World War One England era, and uh, a big transition, I think, culturally for everybody there. It's kind of sort of not a phase, like not a like an elimination of aristocracy, but definitely like differences and uh, changing of class and industry and title, and not necessarily having to be born into um, your position in life and women's suffrage as of the US too. Like a lot of things were happening in that time period. So I think it makes for pretty good stories. Mm -hmm. Like if you ride around that, cause there's so many things happening that it's pretty interesting. Like if you are following a story that can incorporate these historical events that are pretty significant. So we have two very important questions in chat that, um, that I wanna follow up with. The first one um, that I need to know the answer to is 
does the fandom of this like of this era extend to less historically accurate representations including Bridgerton um have you have you been able to see Bridgerton yet and if so what did you think <laughs> I've not seen Bridgerton I've heard I've heard about it um so I can't really speak to that I mean I, I I'm okay with with taking liberties with with historical stuff to a certain point but occasionally there'll be things that really bother me um like the movie gladiator was on the other day and and uh it's like right after they find out that he's the the general and stuff and his buddy who's the um kind of the germania barbarian he's he says something like um you know you killed lots of people in germania and russell crowe says like I fought in lots of countries and that wasn't a country then. I'm like, <laughs> the idea of a country didn't really exist at all. And like the script could have just said, I fought in lots of places. Like they could have really, but like that, that, so like occasionally there'll be an anachronistic thing, but generally speaking, I'm like, you know, it's entertainment and you shouldn't take these things. Like, like if it's meant to be really authentic, I think they go out of their way to try to do that or they're just kind of telling a story and like you shouldn't get too caught up in when something is a little over the top. Um, you've mentioned now class a few times, like, and in terms of something that you're interested in, is that, is that something that you, that you have found interesting throughout your life? Uh, like in the context of like social, social classes. Yeah. Well, I think it just go, it, it goes with the, uh, uh, being interested in history. I mean, I don't know that that in particular is something, um, but that was definitely like uh, with with World War One. There was a big shift in that um, in uh, in the U.S. and in Great Britain because you had a situation where a bunch of men went to fight a war, women were taking on their jobs, finding a new place in society, and then not wanting to give up that position turns into women's suffrage, those sorts of things. So so I think just learning about how things happen, like. And, and what can also really accelerate something like something can be, you know, a hundred year process. And then all of a sudden, you know, two years, something can happen. Um, so I think that's how a lot of things happen in history, whether it's um, uh, the suffrage issues or um, slavery ending in the US. I mean, like lots of things happen like real quick, even though there have been issues for a long time. Is history something that you've been interested in for a while? Yeah, that's what I studied in college. Cool. Um, I, I had considered going down that path, um, but I was kind of getting a, a um, like, I, I sort of saw a little bit of the PhD world in, in history. And I thought that it would actually maybe take away from my interest and love of it uh, to go down that path. So I decided, I thought it was more important for me just to keep it as my own personal interest uh, as opposed to like a profession. Um, so I was, so I, yeah, I kind of steered, steered clear of that kind of upper level academic kind of pathway. Um, staying with that sort of theme of television and knowing things, uh, we hear that you're also like, like super into and good at uh, Jeopardy. Um, so uh, if you got onto the show, how do you think that would go for you? It's super, so I, I think I have a chance to win one show. I think- Tell us, tell us more. I think, well, so it really comes down to um, what categories you get. Um, you know, do you get the daily doubles, you know, and, and do you get final Jeopardy? And there's days where those things can align pretty well. But do I think those things could align pretty well, like two, three days in a row? No. So I think, I think like under the right circumstances, I'd have a shot at maybe winning one show. Um, and part of that has to do with like, if you, if you do things like, like I know people who do crossword puzzles a lot, you know, or Scrabble and like your mind starts to compartmentalize and think in a certain way. And Jeopardy does the same thing. Like, you see the categories and you immediately are like, logically, you know, if it's like, whatever, Dutch artists, like Van Gogh is on there, you know, like you immediately, you know, you'll immediately have like four people 
that are probably going to be answers or three people, and especially if it's an easier clue. So I think the more you play the game and see the game, you just naturally start to think that. But, um, you know, if you get nailed with categories that you're weak in, like I'm really weak in, like if they did Tony Awards or opera, um, you know, some of the science questions, like those areas, like if they hit that hard, but if they do, you know, geography or U.S. history or something like that, then I got a better, or, you know, some of these sports questions, like things of those nature, then, then maybe it works out. But it's hard to be good at it all the time. Like, but yeah, I watch it every day. Um, so. Have you, have you applied? Have you like taken the test? Yeah, I've taken test? the test, yeah. How but many the, times? So the, pro the way the process goes is you take a test. Uh, it's now all online over like a period of time. I think there's 50 questions and you have, um, maybe it's not, I don't remember. Um, you probably have like five seconds to answer each one and you gotta type it in. And I they don't actually tell you what your score is at the end, it just ends, but um, my understanding is if you're like 35 out of 50 or more, you kind of just get put into like the pool of passing people. And then you get randomly selected to come in just to test for it. And then you would actually get an offer. So you could, you could get 50 questions, 50 out of 50, right? 10 years in a row. Like James, the guy who who won the most money ever. I mean, he had said he'd been trying to get on the show for years, you know. So, it it is you can't just be like smarter than everybody else. You got to be smart and have good luck. So, you know, or bribe somebody. I don't know. <laughs> if you know someone, you know, I'd be happy to. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll 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 send those messages. Yeah. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll talk to the. If we could corrupt your jeopardy. That'd be great. Yeah. Both Molly and I at this point have some very tenuous connections to the show business world. So we'll see what we can do. I actually know a former Jeopardy champion. That's true. Or current, Molly's connections are actually much less tenuous. I think it's a current. I had a, I had a math. Yeah, I had a math tutor that won the tournament of champions. Like he won the end of the year. Wow. I don't remember. It was, it was much later because I recognized him and I was like, that's definitely his name. It definitely looks like the guy I knew. And it was, it was him. So. Yeah, uh, but but I but I knew him long before he had ever been on the show. That's awesome. Uh, good question from chat. Um, Ina would like to know who your favorite guest host has been. My favorite guest host? Yeah, I'm assuming on, from Oh Park. oh, so I'm a little bit behind because I taped. Um, so I taped them and watch them, and so while I was snowboarding, I wasn't watching it. So right now I'm actually on Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> um probably like his last two or three shows so i'm i think i i would say this um i don't think that you need to be like super gregarious or talkative necessarily what you need to do is if you clear the board if no questions are left on the board the host is doing a pretty good job like and and most of them have been doing that like i think i would say dr oz is probably my least favorite what I've seen, he kind of pontificates a bit, like I find it unnecessary. Um, but like everybody, I think has done a pretty good job of just kind of keeping the show rolling. And I do think that they all care. I think I think they want to do well. Um, you can tell like it's important to them that they like don't mess it up. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you like you, if you host a game show for two weeks, I mean, you're hardly going to find like a, a rhythm. You know, you got to do it forever. Um, for years to really have that kind of, but yeah, but I would say if they're clearing the board, they're doing a pretty good job. Anybody who if questions left on the board on answers drive me nuts. So, and sometimes that's the contestants fault so they get too many wrong answers, but the host needs to be like setting that kind of rhythm. And I think they've all done a pretty good job of doing that. All right. Well, let's uh, let's let's sadly turn away from television and back towards triathlon. I'm sure we'll get some more TV questions in here. But um, so, I mean, you've been in triathlon ever since you graduated from college. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you migrated from doing it as an amateur into like making it your you know making it your job, not just not just as an athlete, but also yeah, as, like, I mean, in the industry. Yeah, the. Uh... 
I mean, in college, so I started in college and um, initially I was just kind of looking for like, I, I liked the idea that it was sort of a, a three sport thing, although I didn't swim for like two years. So I was really doing two sports, but I was racing three sports. Um, and then, and then in like 2002, I was, I was thinking, I was like, okay, if I actually want to get good, I'm, I'm going to need to start swimming a lot. So I, so that's when I kind of, when I started swimming and, um, did an Ironman, you know, I did an Ironman when I was just after my sophomore year, that's like a kind of a bucket list type of thing. And I was 12 hours and 55 minutes. And then my second race was my senior year. Well, really senior and a half. Cause I was, I graduated in four and a half years. So, um, and in that race, I went 920. And so that was like when I had actually prepared for an event. Um, and basically in between that time period, I was sort of teaching myself how to train. I'd read, I'd go to this thing called the library and check out books. And <laughs> I would actually like bring home this stack of books and like read, how, do, how does one train for, and not necessarily even triathlon. It was like cycling, running, rowing. I'd read about anything kind of aerobic based. Um, and one thing I did, I had in college was, you know, I had, I had time to train a lot. So I rode my bike a lot primarily. And that's kind of what sort of had me going forward. And, um, coming out of college, I wasn't necessarily going to like race pro, but I qualified for Hawaii like that following year. And so I was like, well, I'll, I'll kind of do whatever work odd jobs race and then do something else. And so I did that race, had a pretty good race there. And then I got a, approached by uh, Joe Friel and he wanted to sponsor me and coach me. And so I was like, well, I don't even know if I'm going to keep doing this. Like, but eventually I did decide to keep doing it. And then, um, so raced kind of amateur term professional was a terrible professional, um, for at least two years. Um, then, um, during that time period, I decided I'd kind of been like roaming around, not really living anywhere just living on couches. And I decided to move to Boulder full time. Cause I really thought like, I was like, in, you know, in, in college, I just stayed in one place and just like put my head down and like train, train, train. And so I felt like I needed to really be doing that. I was like, I need to just settle myself into one place and just like repeat, repeat, repeat. And that's kind of what I did in Boulder. And, um, also met Brooke like shortly after that. And she was a big part of like me making it. Cause she was just so kind of on board. <laughs> she was just so supportive and like, uh, we were able to, so I was able to just kind of like get to work. And I think once I really got to work is when I started to make some progression, you know, initially it's, can I get into the top 10 or a top five, top three, and then, you know, maybe one day try to win or something like that. And so, um, yeah, I wouldn't even necessarily like sometimes some of my better races, I don't even necessarily consider them my better results and vice versa. Um, especially all the second places I have, I don't, I like, I have, um, I have like six or seven fourth places <laughs> and most of those races are better than every second race, second place race. Cause I usually fell to fourth because I went for it. And usually second place was more of like. I wasn't actually in contention to win. So I was sort of consolidating my position and then executed to get a good result. Um, and alongside all that, I was coaching. I was always working, you know, I mean, I wasn't working like 40 hours a week, but I was always doing pieces of work related to triathlon, whatever it was coaching, training camps, um, eventually running endurance corner. I was like more of its admin and stuff like that. So I was never, I was never straight up like, I only race and train for a living, but all of it was interconnected and kind of like everything was moving together sort of up the ranks, I guess. Can you tell us a little more about uh, working with Endurance Corner? How did that start and um, and how did that unfold? Well, Gordo Byrne started the company um, and, and um, that was 2007. And he had, uh, I had kind of in his, years before then he used to run this forum uh called gordo world and that used to be something that i frequented and it was actually like 
it was a really it was actually a very very amazingly like civil place and lots of productive conversations about training and i learned a lot and i asked people questions and they would share their and, and everyone was very open and gordo had always been very open with his training and racing like shared everything and that kind of created an environment i think that we need to see more of in general is just kind of like sharing what leads to success like people who are doing well uh, i think swimming does a good job of this actually lots of like really successful swim coaches i think they almost feel obligated that they have to share like what's working with the industry and that's what i kind of thought was going on there and so i had always kept in touch with gordo even though we weren't really like friends uh irl and um but uh so he started this company and initially i came on and uh he was doing these kind of had this idea of doing training camps and so i sort of took that part of the business and kind of created a like created that part of like for sort of formalized it and cleaned it up and started turning it into this thing that we did and that i was kind of in charge of and he was in charge of the overall company and then a bunch of us coached as well so that was kind of and then over time, he was sort of moving out of it. And so I started taking over more of the roles of sort of overseeing the company um, while also coaching and stuff. And as I did that, then I got other people to kind of take over the um, camp side of the business. And so, so yeah, so that was all like pretty kind of a learning experience for me of understanding, you know, how to work in a, because I don't have any other sort of background in, in business other than what I was doing with that. And so we're always, always learning um, what to do and problems would come up and I wouldn't have anyone to really go to other than the internet. So I would, <laughs> I'd learn things the hard way when they came up. And I think that has kind of um, benefited me long-term because I usually am comfortable like seeking out solutions to things that I don't know how to do. Uh, tell us a story about one of those learning things the hard way in business. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm sure I'm sure Molly and I have made the same mistake at some point. But yeah, tell us a story of uh, some thing that went wrong and how you fixed it. Uh, well, there was one thing that happened where there, there was a there was a scamming uh, program going on where um, people were basically like emailing out these copyright infringement so it'd be like if you wrote a blog and you posted a picture of some athlete on it you know they would basically be like you're in copyright infringement you need to pay 500 dollars to have this released and all this type of stuff and my understanding was that like it's not necessarily uh, what they're doing isn't necessarily illegal but it's completely unethical like like the usage of that photo would probably be worth like two dollars um and they probably didn't have the rights to usage or the copyright at the time that you were using it. And your intentions of using said photo, if you're not actually selling something, but you're educating, then the rules of the internet change and all this type of stuff. Well, I didn't know any of this, but I basically was able to figure out like, what is this scam? Where is it originating? What are people doing? What does it mean to have right of usage? What does it mean to have copyright? What types of photos should you have, have and use? And what is your, and the reality is, is that a lot of these things are really, like, unless you have like an item to sell right next to a photo, it's really hard to distinguish like what someone owes for this, that, or the other. But just delving into that world, like would have never come up had I not been trying to be like a phishing scam of extortion. <laughs> um, and then another time was I was just re um, revamping like your entire uh, billing system because I wanted to streamline it and like really cut down on admin time and so I just went into a world of of different merchant accounts what they require like what are the issues um, having those accounts freeze your money because they think you're fraud and then having to go back and dealing with issues so sort of anticipating those things happening whenever you're changing up the way that payments are coming in and out and stuff like that so I didn't know any of that stuff and I wouldn't call myself an expert on it, but I certainly like had to learn how to deal with it um, because of a problem and there was no one to really consult at the time. So I know that while the, while you were running a business, you were also simultaneously coaching, um, which is something that Chris and I know a bit about as well. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your coaching ethos was? Like, what did you, what did, what do you feel like you, um, you've brought to that career? Well, I think that I was always trying to learn myself, you know? And so, um, I was always in a position to like, try to learn more for things for me selfishly. And then I would also like be able to try different ideas out. Like, I'd be like, I don't just have me as a, as a guinea pig. I've got like eight of us. I'm like, we can all try these different things. And I can see how they're working and how they're responding. Um, I think the main thing that I really kind of, when I look at coaching and what's going on with people is really, it's really just kind of understanding what, what it is that gets them out the door, what it is that they, um, respond like what sort of fitness response do they have in the timing that it takes and then tweaking their tapers because everyone kind of tapers a little bit differently um so a lot of things can be the same and i think that's like we're are not the same but there's a lot of like general rules that would work right um in training but those things i think are super nuanced and what you got to really pay attention to as a coach because i mean there was there's one one guy i coach who's the fastest person i coach and I just made a simple change. Like we'd been working together and I had been seeing some of his, like he wasn't racing poorly, but I was just like, I, he just has so much more potential. Like, you know, I've seen what he can do in training. And, and all I basically did was like shortened his builds. Like I didn't make them as long. I was like, I'm training him too long. I knew like what I see at the end of his training blocks is what the race needs to be. I need to just like cut that in half. But I'm not really changing the philosophy. I'm basically just changing the timing. Whereas somebody else, I might be like, I need to have that whole amount of time because they just don't respond quite as quickly. So that's what I think you get with people. Like the more people you work with, you start to see like, okay, a lot of people, you know, what is really an outlier and what actually kind of works generally speaking, you know, and, um, and just to constantly keep trying, like, you know, I try to, um, figure out something, especially like a race week. That's something I'm super like, if we found a race week that works, Let's use it until it doesn't. And then if it doesn't work, then let's change it. But like, let's keep, let's keep trying something different to see what we can get out of you. Um, that, um, you know, is just sort of, yeah, just paying attention and getting their feedback and seeing what, what, what works over time. Um, so uh, you, you, you made a career out of being like very, very steady on the swim and the bike. I'm just like incredibly consistent. And then just absolutely mowing down the field on the run. Um, like, can you talk to us about how you arrived at discovering that? Cause I imagine that it wasn't always like that and you kind of discovered it at some point. Um, but tell us about your process of figuring out how you raced to your best. Well, I mean, I, I feel, you know, I was, I always thought of my, like early on, I was definitely, more of a cyclist like that was definitely a strength that kind of faded or like got a little more normalized in the field you know um it's something that i kind of always wanted it was sort of like i you know when i was a really good cyclist maybe it came at the expense of the other things and then as i was trying to get it all together like i kind of always wanted to be more of a strong cyclist like <laughs> that's like something i took a little bit more pride in but i think what it really comes down to is just that in executing a marathon at the end of an Ironman, it looks like that's a strength, but that's really just like, that's all three pieces being put together. When you execute that piece, you can kind of do better than everybody else because they've cashed in like their chips early, but it wasn't really like, I wasn't really being conservative. Like I didn't have a, a really big top end engine. So to me, it was like, how can I rev at 90% across all three sports the whole day? Um, because if you ran, like if you took a lot of the guys that we raced against and we all did like an open 5k, I would get dusted, you know? And, uh, but if it's a marathon at the end of an Ironman and maybe it's hot outside, then I do okay relative to that. So I really kind of like, I needed all of that fatigue and beaten up and all that to be in place to then make it look like I was excelling. But really I was just kind of like racing like to my best ability, but like I wanted that ability to be faster. I mean, I think I think people took me as being conservative. But I'm like, no, I'm actually going pretty hard. I just 
this is as hard as I can go. Um, so, yeah. And not, not conservative. I always thought of you, I should have said that differently. I always thought of you as a very, a very smart racer, you know? Well, I knew, cool. like, I, I mean, like, not that I wouldn't take chances and stuff, but I was always sort of, um, you know, weighing things. Like, I knew, I knew when someone was making a bad decision. So, like, like a, for a good example would be sort of on the bike, you know, when there were group dynamics at some point in time, I thought it was a lot more important to go hard to keep contact with the group than to keep contact with a person. I was like, because the group dynamic is like a much more important piece and it will probably calm down. Whereas like, you know, if you're responding to one single person, then you may, you may not be, you may be taking a calculated risk that works out, but chances are like, if it's the group dynamic, it's worth doing it at least for a while. So, you know, we're going hard at the start of the swim to make a group is different from, you know, some other time. So like, yeah, definitely like knowing okay, this is a moment where I really need to go for it. Um, and kind of that, that was a piece that I think, and I paid attention to people, you know, I mean, I, I watched other results. I watched what people, how they race, you know, what works out, like where, but I also expected people to always want to improve as well. So I was like, this is what they have done, but it may not be what they're going to be doing because they might be better today. But I was definitely like, um yeah you know, we would go i would go take a, a race list and uh, you know in the meat of my career when i'd really raced a lot of people and i would talk to brooke and i'd be like this is this is what this person is really good at this is what this person you need to mark this person this person i expect this group to to come out first and then we'll be here and there'll be a chase and these people will be behind us and this is probably how it might play out and like what you should be looking for and who you should take seriously and like try to relay that information to me whenever you can so I was definitely trying to study as much as I could to try to give myself an advantage and and know kind of what was going on. You mentioned being successful in hot races. Uh, we have a bunch of athletes who are headed to St. George where it's forecast to get into the mid nineties this weekend. Do you have any recommendations for how to, how to succeed in those conditions? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, so, I would say like, there's, there's one thing I think that I have is that I grew up in Houston, um, which I don't necessarily think is like a physiological thing, but I think it is a psychological piece. I just experienced a lot of heat um, and I became comfortable in those scenarios. And I used to think that race, racing in the heat was easier than training in the heat because someone's like handing you water and ice constantly. Whereas like, if you're doing a training run, in the heat, you know, you got to have your own bottles and go through things. And um, I did a lot of Ironman Texas coming straight from Boulder and I did not do simulated heat training, um, but I would do like sauna steam rooms um, and not excessive. Like I would be like, kind of build up the tolerance of like, just when I think I'm about to have an anxiety attack, like, go two more minutes, you know, and like keep pushing that a little bit. And then once like a steam room, that might only be like 20 minutes, you've maxed out saunas are a little bit longer. Um, and, and there's definitely like scientific data that's kind of supporting a little more of passive heat training versus simulated. But if you're going to do simulated heat training, I think people just take it a little bit too far. They're like, Oh, I got to like wear a parka and like ride my bike and turn the heat on. I'm like, all you need to do is just like ride the trainer and turn your fan off. Like that's heat training. Cause you're, you're sweat. Like, I think sweating is like getting used to, you know, maybe a sweat rate that you would see in those circumstances. Um, and, uh, you know, don't be afraid to take in a lot of fluids on the, the course itself. I think, I think people would be surprised as to how much I would consume, um, both in training and racing, you know, being like chugging full bottles, at periods of time, if I felt I needed it. Um, and so may, maybe the Texas training and stuff gave me kind of that intuition of kind of like, I need to take in a ton of stuff right now. Um, so I know that maybe there's like rules on what the gut can or cannot handle. And I've 
tell you, like, I've never abided by those ever. I'll just keep taking things. Cause I mean, the alternative is it's like, yeah, you either like in the case of bonking, it's like you either get sick or you bonk. So you might as well take the risk of getting sick, you know, or, you know, you're taking in a bunch of fluids. You might get like a jostling stomach or you get dehydrated. Like you have to take a gamble one way or the other. And so in some of those instances, I was more comfortable just kind of taking the chance on taking in what I felt I needed. <clears throat> um, uh, tell us the story of like the most mistake plagued race you ever had. Uh, uh, that's good. Um, well, I had, I feel like the most embarrassing thing that I ever had happen was in, in Hawaii, 2014. I, I had like gotten gapped off the swim group, but only by only in like the last 200, 300 meters, you know? So they were like, they were getting into transition before me, but I was still kind of there. Mm -hmm. And I ran through transition so fast and got out on the bike course and I had never taken my swim skin off. Oh. So I was on the queen K and I was like, God, this feels so tight. Like, why does my kit feel so tight? And I looked down and I had my swim skin on. So, so then I really did lose contact with the group. So I had, uh, um, in Texas in 2018, I was mounting my bike and I had pulled the sleeves on and what it had gotten stuck on my elbow. Right. So I hadn't pulled my kit all the way on and I went, I like ran out threw my leg over and I immediately was like, I am definitely going to crash because it was pull. It was like pulling me back. It wasn't letting me. And so I just slammed right there. And like, I could tell there was this woman that really wanted to laugh, but she was like trying to be polite, but she should have laughed. Cause I mean, like I would have laughed at me uh, in that scenario. Um, what else happened? Oh, there was this time. Um, so what's now Arizona 70.3 was at one point in time called Soma. Love that race. So they, uh, so I was doing that race and I had just, I had done terribly, but I was, so I'd like finished the bike and I was like, I'll just cruise the run. And part portions of that bike course or run course are, um, you know, like a concrete path and then there'll be like dirt next to it. And so I was running on the dirt since I wasn't really concerned about being fast. And there was a porta potty like for an aid station, like set off and someone swung the door open, like as I was running <laughs> and it, I hit the side that like had no give. And so then I flew back and did like a somersault and everything. So I had that happen to me. Um, this guy three, three, three is good. That's a good, that's yeah. a good, uh, that's They're not, but it's not one. <laughs> I'm not, I can't think of a race where like one thing, but I will say that every race, even the good ones, like if you really have someone break them down, like if Jan Ferdino breaks the world record, right. And you really get him to break the race down for you. There'll be all these things that happened that he just worked his way through. And you're like, so I, I sort of equate it to like, if you were driving in a car for eight hours a day, would you make every green light? Like, no, but you might make more one day than another. So you're actually like dealing with stuff all day long, even when it's super successful. Just sometimes when you're successful, you tend not to remember a lot of the pieces of adversity. But if you actually get someone to break it down, they'll be like, oh yeah, and this was happening, this was happening. And so, so people have success in spite of the bad things, not because they don't happen. 100% agree. Every athlete out there, listen to this. <laughs> um, so now that you are officially, uh, what did we decide? A former professional triathlete, not a retired professional triathlete. Former, former professional. A former, <laughs> former professional triathlete. Um, I'm curious to know what you'll miss about um, competing at that level and what you are like not even sad to say goodbye to. So I'm not sad to see uh, riding in the cold. So I, I rode my bike outside basically 100 percent of the time uh, in boulder oh i did not was not big on the trainer um and so yeah so i just i rode and basically i was like as soon as i don't have to ride my bike when it's cold outside i'm just gonna ride when it's nice um that was a nice thing i think the thing i really miss is just being like so um 
just so motivated to try and succeed at something like that passion is, I mean, it may, I mean, you know, I think it'd be nice to think that there'll be something else that comes along, but there may not be something else that I feel as passionately about as I felt in those moments. And the, and also just like the excitement to compete, you know, like I, um, you know, would just be like, just, you know, couldn't wait to get up in the morning, you know, even though I was like really stressed, I was also really excited to, um, like I hated waiting like the two days before the race, like I just wanted to race. And so I'll miss that desire to be competitive like that. That'll be something. Um, but yeah, cold weather, cold weather racing or cold weather riding. Won't miss that. Um, just being really, 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 really tired all the time. Um, I probably won't miss that that much. Um, so I, I forced you to tell us about your embarrassing moments. Um, tell us about winning Boulder in 2014. It's your home race. You did it a bunch of years. Um, walk us through what you had to do to, to win that race. Well, it was basically a mono a mono race between me and Richie Cunningham. So he had uh, about a little under three minutes on me out of the swim. And then we, we rode the bike, um, you know, solo chasing each other and we were riding for so, and it was a one loop bike course. So both Brooke was out in the car, um, following the race and Richie had, um, Ben Hoffman and Kelsey following him. And basically we were all helping each other, like giving splits. And I mean, the splits were saying, staying the same to the second, like, they were like, we were riding 180 K like at the exact possible same speed. And I had, I had ridden the course and really knew it well. And I had this like plan that, um, there was kind of this straightaway section from call it hundred and K to 140 K that I thought you can make up a lot of time on somebody, but on race day, we had a lot more favorable wins. Um, so the speed was staying high and I was expecting the speed to get low. So if you started riding harder, you'd start pulling. So I was not taking any time out of them. And it wasn't until the last like 10 miles where I took some time out of him. And my, my feeling with Richie was like, Richie, Richie was like, if he wasn't the toughest racer I've ever known, he was at least one of the, and, um, and he really kind of thrived in big world championship, big competitive field scenarios. So I thought that the situation being like a one-on-one -on -one was a little more in my favor. Cause he's like, he's probably more comfortable if he had like 20 people gunning at him than one. But my feeling was that if I didn't have a close enough gap to him on the run, that he wouldn't start the run. My, my hope was that the gap on the bike would be small enough that he would try to take the run out too fast and get a gap and then pay for it late. But so the, so the gap came, we ended up riding within like 10 seconds of each other, the split works. So it, it went out a bit and then it came back and it was basically like the exact same split that we had started the, the bike with, like coming out of the water. And then we got on the run and it was the same thing. It was like the exact same split. Like we were running the exact same space. And um, I, then I was getting worried because I was like, if he doesn't make, if, if, if I can't do something soon, like you get too late in a race, like people are going to, even if they let the gap come down, they'll get a second win, win you know. So um, I kind of finished the first loop of the run and I was like amping myself up to, I was like, I'm going to run as hard as possible because I had a big gap to, third so i was basically like this is win or that's like it doesn't matter if i completely blow up i'll probably still get second anyway so i gotta go um and right then like then the gap just came down and i went across it uh and then i uh so i probably got across at like mile 17 and there was a turnaround at mile 20 from there so i tried to run as hard as possible to like get as big a gap so that maybe he would just like not want to have to. So the gap did go out. And then I was in a position I'd never really been in before. I'd never been leading. I was like, now 
like I'm the only one who could screw this up. And that was really awkward for me. Like I had never been in a position of like, it was just like chase to the finish, chase to the finish. So I was, you know, even in the final couple miles, like people wanted to high five me and stuff and I wouldn't do anything. Even in the straightaway, I like coming down the finishing shoot, I was like, I have to cross the line and then I'll come back out and like high five some people. But I was like, I have to finish. <laughs> Cause I was like, something will happen. I'll break my ankle in the last hundred meters or something. Do the Chris Lee get carried across. Yeah. The yeah I get to lose half your intestine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm curious to know what, uh, even if it's not like the big, what comes next for you, what project do you have? Like, what are you, do you have anything on your horizon that you're, that you're pursuing next? Not like, um, there's a couple things personally. I've been, um, during, um, so I'm trying to record memoirs from my parents, awesome. like an interview style. Um, and I started it, I visited them during COVID for a while and we started it, but I haven't been able. So that's something that I am wanting to try to work on again in the next few weeks. And that's kind of like a personal project. And I thought about maybe expanding that out a little bit more to some of the more of the family members, a couple aunts, or maybe something like that, that try and get like a full picture of there. Cause there is, there's this like family book from the early 19th century where like somebody wrote a memoir. And I thought, you know, that like having those types of things for the future is really important, like in their own words, not just like stories that we tell, you know, like let people tell their own stories. Um, so that's like a personal thing. Um, two years ago, I was in England um, coaching somebody to try to do an English channel crossing and we didn't get a weather window. So we never even got to try. And then COVID happened. So he didn't get a spot in 2020. And so hopefully this August, 2021, we go there and get that done. Um, so that would be a really sort of gratifying thing for, for him, I'm sure. And also for me, I'd like to see that get done. So those would just be like two small personal projects. Beyond that, nothing big. Just coaching somebody to a little channel crossing. Uh, <laughs> NBD. <laughs> no, no, that's a, yeah, it's not my world. It's not my world. I, I had to, um, as a, if you're a coach out there, I think it's good to have like 10 or 20% of things that is not your specialty on your plate so that you have to learn about something. Don't make it like 50%. Because you then you're just bad. You always. If you're only bad, with, if you don't know what you're doing with one person, it's a lot better than when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> then you just don't know what you're doing, right? right. <laughs> you have one that's person just... who scares you, and you're growing. But... Right. Yeah. Everybody, uh, that's yeah. just incompetence. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, uh, so yeah, ultra, ultra swimming is a world that I've I've learned about. Um, not a lot of information out there. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's a world that could use more resources, I found. Um, so. Well, I look forward to the ones that you will add to it. Um, yeah. This has been a fantastic hour. Justin Dare, thank you so much for joining us here in detention, uh, where we will think about what you've done. Um, for those of you who are joining us out there in the interwebs, make sure you come back for Thursday morning Zwift Ride. Uh, we will be uh, joining up again in Internet World at 6.30 a.m. on Thursday. And um, yeah, Justin, thank you so much for, for spending this time to us or it's time with us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, everyone, we will see you soon. Bye.